Welcome everyone. This evening, the Jaffrey Civic Center presents the seventh and penultimate installment of this season's Stories to Share series. My name is Jeff Crocker, and I'm standing in for the irreplaceable and irrepressible <laughs> Joe Steinfield, who is away. Before introducing this evening's speaker, I want to take the opportunity to acknowledge and thank our sponsors, the Savings Bank of Walpole and Beltates Incorporated. I also want to thank Ed Wadizek for skillfully making possible the audio-visual YouTube production of tonight's event. And of course, uh, uh, Sean Driscoll, uh, please watch him. Who's, uh, <laughs> who's uh, running the camera there for his assistance in this endeavor as well. Sean's been, been providing help to this event since day one, I think is what we Well, on the subject of thank yous, I also want to give a big shout out to Nancy Belke uh, and to Jean Duval for arranging this evening post uh, event reception. So now to the evening's program. Do you know where to look for the best salamanders? <laughs> or which mushrooms explode when you throw them? Or how to prowl for an owl? <laughs> for an owl. Well, tonight's speaker knows the answer to all of these questions. And much more. Susie Spickett is the Community Programs Director and Teacher Naturalist for the Harris Center for Conservation Education in Hanta. For more than 30 years, Susie has been helping people of all ages find ways to notice and connect with the wild creatures of our everyday world. Over the course of her career as a naturalist, she has taught thousands of children, adults, and teachers and she's given hundreds of public talks at nature centers, schools, colleges, universities, libraries, and conferences. In 2012, the New Hampshire Environmental Educators recognized Susie by presenting her with its Environmental Educator Award. When not catching frogs with preschoolers or tracking bobcats with middle schoolers or hot walking with her own kids, Susie turns the road. Her articles and essays have been have regularly appeared and been featured in books and magazines. In 2022, Susie's own book, I'm gonna hold that and wave it. Susie's own book, The Animal Adventurer's Guide, was published. They can still get this book, can't they? Yeah. This book is available. Let's talk about that before we're done. That's where they can get it. Uh, this evening, Susie is going to speak on the subject of everyday life, how nature connects us. Please join me in welcoming Susie. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, guys. Or Thank you, people. Um, I really appreciate it, and I'm so grateful to have been asked. And it's so nice to look out into the audience and see people that I know, people that I've worked with, uh, people who I'm friends with, and people I don't know. So thank you all for coming tonight. And you'll have to pardon me. I'm a little bit out of sorts, so I'm going to have some notes. And I just got to get them up on my web on my machine before I start to make sure I stay on track, because I can get off track easy. But I love the idea that this is stories to share. And I thought that tonight I would share kind of two personal stories and then a story of how I view the work that I do. And the first story I want to tell is about where I've been working for over 30 years. And I'm so happy to look out into the audience and see Mead Keto, who was the director who hired me to work at the Harris Center, and David Blair, who was a naturalist at the Harris Center, whose files I still use when I'm planning programs. I'm so grateful. The Harris Center, whoa, 
<laughs> Somebody was very excited about the Harris Center. <laughs> Just raise your hand. How many people have been to the Harris Center? Yay! Um, in case you didn't know what we do, we boil down our mission statement to something about just falling in love with the place that we live. Um, and that's really what we've been doing for the past 50 plus years. And I've been a part of that for 30 years. And we do it in a bunch of different ways. And I think kind of the biggest way that we do it is through education. We work in over 30 different classrooms, four different school districts, public schools primarily, some private schools, some charter schools, some home schools, any kind of kid that wants to come. And if you are a supporter of the Harris Center, this is where a lot of your support goes to because this program requires a lot of money. <laughs> um, and because nobody likes to give money for educational programs, they'll give money for land protection, but really the Harris Center is really about making the connection from the land to the people to the people to the land. And through kids is really a great way to do it. Um, these students are studying trees and keen. So we teach in all different kind of habitats from very rural, like work that I do in Bennington or Hancock, to Jaffrey, to Ringe, to Keene. Um, and the idea is that you don't have to live anywhere special to find nature. It happens everywhere you are. We also do it through um, community programs. And our community programs are lifespan programs. So this program right here, um, you're seeing the bottom part of my legs, and I'm doing a babies in backpacks and toddlers in tow program. These are for our youngest naturalist. My youngest person was 11 days old. Of course, they're not really learning what I have to say, but it's a lot about educating the parents. And we go all the way up through every stage of life. This is a program for a life care facility um, where we're doing a demonstration of bird banding. And it's just an idea that no matter where you are in any part of your life, you can be connect connected to nature. And nature can empower you, it can inspire you, and you can feel inspired back to nature. So reciprocity, giving back. All of this work is done under the land protection the Harris Center has worked on for over 50 years, protecting over 25,000 acres of land in this region alone. And that is done through landowners like many of you who might be here, partner organizations like Monadnock Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy, New Hampshire Audubon, so on, and um, towns, conservation commissions, and, and things like that. And without this landscape, um, we, our, our neighborhoods would look really different. So I like when I'm driving down the road in this region, I feel really grateful to the land protection efforts that places like the Harris Center has made because I think it would look really different. The landscape would look different and this is full of inspiration and nature waiting for us to discover. Um, and when we are protecting land, it isn't just for um, people, a lot of it is for wildlife. And the idea that Mead came up with was connecting parcels of land. Now this is pretty common in conservation protection now, the idea of making a contiguous greenway. But when Mead thought about it, it was brand new. It was a new idea. And the Harris Center was in the forefront of creating something that he called the super sanctuary. And that's where if you look at the Harris Center, the land is sort of connected. And the idea is big enough for wi wildlife to roam, large wildlife like moose or keystone wildlife like bobcat and coyote. And all of this is there for people to head out into the land. The newest part of the Harris Center that we've been doing is conservation science and research. And that's opening up our lands to researchers and scientists um, who are studying the animals and the plants that are on that land and drawing conclusions about them and ways of conserving even forward. And some of it has to do with community scientists. So people coming out and helping to count hawks or maybe some of you have participated in our wildly popular salamander brigade. Anybody cross salamanders and frogs? All right, last year the Harris Center with its volunteers crossed over 10 thousand amphibians on the first rainy nights of spring. 
It's not too late, as you might know. We just got a bunch of snow. The salamanders haven't moved yet, all of them, in this area in particular. So on the next rainy night, head out to one of our spots and help us cross some salamanders. All of the work of the Harris Center, I think of as future forward. Um, we're doing this stuff now, we're enjoying the benefits now, but it's really about the future. It's about the next generation of people having a place that, that they can love and live in and learn from just like we have and just like the people before us have. So I like this, one generation plants the trees so the next can enjoy the shade. Now, you might think, somebody like me, this is me doing a monarch and butterfly caterpillar count with Francie von Mertens, you might think, oh, this, this person, Susie Spickle, she must have grown up someplace full of wildlife, right? Because I seem so nature-oriented. But I want to show you. This is my second story for tonight. This is my neighborhood where I grew up. This is Brooklyn, New York. And it's not the Brooklyn, New York of now. It's the Brooklyn, New York of 1970s and 1980s. It was gritty, it was dirty, it was dangerous. Um, and this was my actual neighborhood. Like, I lived about two minutes from here. This is what I saw every day on my walk to school, Kings Highway. Um, and as you can notice, there's not a lot of green space there. So how does somebody like, who grows up in this environment end up loving nature so much? Well, I was so fortunate. This is me. I'm, I'm screaming with joy next to my brother. Um, my parents were school teachers. They taught in the public school system of New York City, and they had the summers off. And in 1952, they bought a tiny little cabin in Vermont. And every summer, on the last day of school that my pa parents had to work, we would pick up my mom, pick up my dad, and drive right up to Vermont. And we spent our summers until the very last second that we could in Vermont. And that's what got in my heart. I knew from a very young age that I was much happier with animals and nature than I was with cars and concrete. And that's why I'm screaming with joy. <laughs> and he just here's a little collage of my life. Um, this is me on Townsend Dam in Townsend, Vermont, where I spent many, many happy summers. Um, and that's where I first discovered my love of aquatic invertebrates, dragonfly nymphs, and crayfish, and even leeches. I love leeches. Um, and I know, strange, I love slugs too. Um, and I had my first best friend. This is me and my first best friend, Charlie the dog. Um, I knew that I liked animals often more than I liked people. <laughs> um, and that went in my heart. And I spent a lot of my life um, as a teenager and as a young adult working jobs that brought me close to nature and animals. And um, that's me holding a little baby bear down in the corner where the, one time the Harris Center had a bear program that had a little baby bear and Jim Fowler from Wild Kingdom, remember that guy? Mm -hmm. And his, what was his buddy's name, Mead? What was that guy with the wooden leg? Oh, that was Jim Fowler. I thought it was his buddy, Jim Fowler. He had a wooden leg, and the bear climbed up his leg <laughs> with the claws. But he said, don't worry, it doesn't hurt. I got a wooden leg. Um, all these chances for me to be in wildlife and engage with animals, and some of them you know, having an opportunity like holding a baby bear, um, that, just, that just fed my fire. Um, and I settled in Hancock after attending Antioch um, graduate school and interning at the Harris Center, and I never left. I was so fortunate to find a place like the Harris Center, a place that matched my passion for nature so well. Um, and this is my kids. I have three children um, and my dog, that's her snout up there, and me teaching about nature, uh, owl pellet dissection in that class. Um, and I've just been so lucky to have found a place like the Harris Center and people who care about nature as much as me, that I, I feel like I won the mega bucks um, in so many ways. And I'm grateful to my parents who recognized 
the importance of having a place to go to when you live in a city, having green places to go to. I didn't include in my pictures, but my parents were big bird watchers. And in New York City, we didn't, we didn't take pictures because we had binoculars. We went birding in all the hot spots of New York City, Central Park, Prospect Park, where we got mugged as a family. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Queens, where they had Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge, all of those places, any green scrap of land we went to. And then in the summers, we just enjoyed the wildlife. And that's, that's what set me on my role of being outside and teaching people and connecting people to nature. And, and my work has primarily been with children that's the majority of the work that I do. And I just recently had a job offer to go work at a different place. And I considered it for a few minutes. But the job was like with adults, all of it. And I thought, oh, that's really boring. <laughs> Who is going to make me laugh as much as kids? Um, spending time outside with kids really fills up my heart, really inspires me, inspired me to write my book. Um, and that's what I do in my spare time. Um, I make time for it, I, I should say. It's not my spare time. I dedicate time for it. I always thought I wanted to be a writer, and it took me until I was about in my late 40s to realize well, you can't just wish to be a writer. You actually have to do it. Um, and I got serious, and I, I worked hard on it, and I started to get published. I got published in David Sobel's books first. David Sobel is a wonderful place-based educator out of Harrisville. He was a real mentor to me when I was at Antioch. He really liked my writing, and he published it in a few of his books as a guest essayist. And then that inspired me to go further and hand in my writing to other places. And I've been published in um, Taproot Magazine. Um, Northern Woodlands has been my biggest publisher. And just recently, you can begin to look for me more often in Yankee Magazine, which I'm really enjoying writing for. And all of that fed my fuel to write a book. And I wanted to write a book for kids. And I wrote a book about I kind of took what, what at the Harris Center us educators called the gold. I put down all of the things that I know that work with kids outside when it comes to animals. Because I truly believe that it's animals, and I'm going to talk more about this in just a moment, that really help build that bond with children and the natural world. That that's the key for them in so many ways, a connection to animals, feeling like they understand an animal, that an, understand, an animal is like in their heart. So I put all my best activities into this book, and I, I'm excited to say that it's in its second printing. It won a, an award, and you can look for two new books for me in 2025. One will be The Guide to Forest Magic, which will be all about kind of the imaginative space that nature gives. Think secret forts. Um, fairy houses, uh, potions, that kind of thing, the imaginative space of nature, creative space of nature. And the next one is my first book of fiction. It is a actual me, you're going to like this, a field guide, not to birds, not to mammals, which I love, but to fairies. Um, and the idea of, of magic and nature kind of going hand in hand and inspiring a creative place in childhood. Um, you know, that's a lot about who I am, but what I really want to do is share with you who I see my animal self as. And these are our four animals that really speak to me and resonate with me. I'm definitely a bit of an otter. I'm very playful. Give me a sl anything to slide on, whether it's a sled, my skis, even occasionally a surfboard, though I'm not very good at it. I love the action of sliding and being playful outside. I'm a bit like a bee, a bumblebee in particular. I'm very busy and very focused and very loyal. Bees are loyal to the flowers that they're feeding on. They'll feed on all the zinnia, and then they'll move on to the next group of flowers. And that's kind of me. I, I stick to something, and I'm busy with it. I'm a fox. I'm very adaptable. Foxes um, even live in Brooklyn, New York. Now, not when I grew up there, um, but I'm a bit adaptable. You know, I can still go back to the city. Um, I can be in the country 
not right now I live in the suburbs of Hancock. <laughs> and I actually am a lot like a turtle. And my friend Matt Patterson back there is the expert on turtles, um, a wonderful illustrator. But I think of myself as a turtle because a turtle has its home with it, with it all the time. And I'm a bit of a homebody. I, I like being at my home in Hancock. And I think to myself, why would I go anywhere else? Everything is so beautiful here. I've got everything I need in my own backyard and so much more to discover. So I'm going to ask you to take a moment and in your own self think about what animals are you most allied with. And if you want, you can share with the person next to you, but just take a moment and think, who is your animal in your heart? And maybe you're like me and you can't just pick one. So take a moment and think, who would you be? What animals in your heart? And now I'm going to just ask you to raise your hand. This is always interesting. Um, raise your hand if the animals in your heart were mammals. That's a majority. Lots of people see themselves as mammals. Anybody as a bird? All right. Soaring, flying, I get that. Anybody see themselves as an amphibian? Frog, a salamander? No amphibians in the audience? Maybe somebody at home at Zoom is an amphibian. How about a reptile? I'm looking at Matt, of course. <laughs> I would have been shocked if Matt didn't raise his hand. Matt, I hate to put you on the spot, but what reptile? A wood turtle. Don't blame you. They're beautiful with their red skin. One day we're going to find them together. Anybody choose an invertebrate? No, I know. I do, this talk, I do this type of talk in many different situations, and rarely does anybody choose an invertebrate. But, you know, it might be worth thinking about, in the quiet moments of your mind, which invertebrate you are most like in your own heart. Maybe it's a little bit like a starfish or a sea anemone, or maybe you're like me and a bumblebee is part of you. Um, yeah, I want to talk about how connected and how important that connection is of humans and animals and everyday animals, not the wild things that are hard to see, but the animals that we encounter every day in our life. And sometimes we encounter them so much we forget to pay attention to them, like the lowly squirrel. But you're going to hear today, after you leave today, you're, you're all going to go home and get connected to the squirrels in your backyard. I mean, animals play a huge part in our world. Just think people decorate their bodies with animals, whether it's tattoos or clothing or, or um, jewelry. I mean, if you look, if you go into a store and you look at decorations, animals are on almost everything. Paper plates, baby clothing, uh, you know, socks. Very, very popular on socks. Animals play a huge part. In, and, we are interested in finding connection to animals. We spend time with animals and feel drawn to them, whether there are dogs and cats that we live with, whether they're the birds that come to our bird feeder, any type of livestock you might have. Um, we are drawn to them. And that shouldn't surprise anybody, especially if you're E.O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson, the ant man, as some people called him. Everybody put your thumb up if you've heard of E.O. Wilson. That's good, a few. I'm a huge E.O. Wilson fan, not just for the fact that he loved ants so much he spent his life studying them and discovering them and traveling and being an advocate of ants, but because he professed with his colleague, Stephen Kellart, a theory called biophilia. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight. Biophilia is the idea that our human past is genetically hardwired in us to feel drawn to animals, to pay attention to animals, to, 
to value the importance of time in nature. That it isn't just something nice to do, but it's something that we have to do as humans, that is required of us as humans. Because if we didn't do it, we wouldn't be here today. If we hadn't been aware of the animals around us as we evolved, none of us would be sitting in this room. We would have been somebody's food, somebody's lunch, or we would have been, I don't know, maybe stung by one of these things. <laughs> um, and the opposite of biophilia, which has actually been studied quite extensively, is biophobia, our fears. And I, I want to talk about the innate hyper-awareness that humans have of animals cross-culturally. And these are some of the, the, the main ones. Um, humans have, some people would call it a fear, but I'm going to call it a hyper-awareness of things like spiders and snakes and stinging insects. And that is because we had to have been aware of them. We were aware of large predators that might get us, but when we um, sought safety in the trees of the savanna, where we thought we were safe, these animals might be there. And they weren't after to eat us, mostly. They were there just living their lives, but if we put our hand in the wrong spot, we would suffer for it. And that's hardwired in us, too, that we are hyper-vigilant about them. And in fact, our world still transmits encoded messages about this. Think about all the caution signs in traffic. They're all yellow and black. Why yellow and black? That's because humans are drawn and understand yellow and black means caution. It's evolutionarily hardwired in us. Danger, danger, don't go near it. Yellow and black could sting you. Even orange and black. Think about that, right? So, so much of our encoded messages are based on some of these things that are kind of in us, hardwired in us. And in that, the flip side, the yin to the yang of biophobia is biophilia. The importance of spending time in nature, of connecting to it, of especially open places, whether it is a meadow or a savanna or an open waterway, this these are the landscapes that draw us as humans because it gives us a view of any danger that might be out there. If you're in the savanna, you can see it's open. If you're on, in a meadow, it's open. If you're on the edge of water, you might not want to be in the water because there might be danger in there, but if you're on the edge of water, you are looking, you are paying attention. And as people, I want to say again, that it's not just nice to have nature. It's actually a requirement of humans. It should be a human right to have nature in our lives, to have time in nature, for that to be valued, for that to be something that all of us can say, you know what, I'm taking my lunch break outside for a walk. And doctors across the world are beginning to pay attention to this. In Japan, they can write you a prescription. You go out. You have to go outside. That's your prescription for vitamin N, as Richard Louv would say, vitamin nature. And as children, and that's what I really know best, a requirement of childhood should be time in nature and time, this is going to sound crazy, time to be another animal in nature. Time to step into the, the skin of a lizard or a snake or put on the ears of a rabbit or a chipmunk and live in the, in the fur and the skin because that's the first part of compassion. That's a person, a little person, understanding and, and realizing that they are not just them, that there's other things in the world that, that, that have another perspective, another way of living. And I love this Jane Goodall quote because it's really about caring. When we, only if we understand can we care, and only if we care will we help. So it's really about giving children that space to connect, that space to be one with another animal, to not correct them when they say, oh, the little tadpole misses its mommy. It doesn't matter. It's okay. 
We know, we know as adults, frogs sometimes eat their own tadpoles. We don't need to mention that. We can just say you're right because that's a child putting itself into the world of the animal and creating a sensitivity, a caringness. I know this for a fact. <laughs> this is not my daughter, but it could have been. I, my daughter, she's 24, she spent a couple of years of her life as a cat. And I went with her. We talked meow, talk meow, mama meow, milk mama. I did feed her on the floor. I did draw the line at the kitty litter box. But <laughs> I mean, that to me was her. She, she was a, she's an interesting person. It's hard for my daughter to connect to people. She, she's a little uncomfortable around people. And it took her a long time. She's great with people now, but it took her a long time to get there. But she could feel everything our dog felt. She could live as a cat and understand how important it was to be cared for by a, as a cat, to, to have her needs met. She, it was the place where she began to understand caring and compassion. And so I know that all of us, maybe our kids are grown or maybe we don't have kids, but maybe some of us spend time with kids or see kids. And what I want to say is kids need to be doing the work of being outside in nature, of spending time with the small everyday animals in their world. I'm not talking about going on a whale watching trip, although that's great. I am talking about <coughs> falling in love with the caterpillar in the backyard, holding on to the ladybug and wanting to, to spend the day with the ladybug even though they might have crushed it in their hand because they love it so much. Um, and so Brenda Peterson, a, another person that I'm really a fan of, she writes, in our environmental wars, the emphasis has been on saving species, not becoming them. What I'd like to say is if we aspire to developmentally appropriate science education, the first task is to become animals, to understand them from the inside out before asking children to study them or save them. That's David Sobel, and I totally agree with that. We can't ask our children to fall in love with the polar bear by telling them, in 10 years, there's going to be no polar bears left. I mean, why would they ever invest? They need time with the animals around them before they can be asked to do anything about it. And we do, too. We do, too. I like to say something else that David Sobel said to me is that, and, and this goes with Rachel Carson's quote, play incorporating animistic and magical thinking is important because it fosters healthy, creative, and emotional growth of a child and fosters empathy and wonder. Written in 1960s, still, in fact, more relevant today, as we'll talk about in a few moments. And David Sobel would say, it's not the 1,000 nature facts or science facts that matters. It's the one time that somebody feels connected to something in nature that goes into their heart. That's what matters. It's not those facts. We have our whole life to find out facts, but it's the moments of experience that really go into the heart of a human. And even though I'm talking about kids and how this is important for kids, it's not just important for kids. It's actually really important for us as adults not to forget that and to make space for it in our lives. Go lay down, I'm looking at Dr. Davini back there, go lay down next to your dog, go hold your cat and purr with it. I mean, just be in it for a moment. And so really spending time outside, exploring, noticing, observing our own backyards is what really matters. And it doesn't have to be the big stuff. In fact, I like the small stuff better. Because we forget to look at that. We forget to think about how amazing it is that a squirrel is eating all of our bird seed. We might shake our fist at it, but the fact that you are getting to watch a wild animal come and eat and, and behave so close to you should inspire you. There's a lot to be learned by watching squirrels. At the Harris Center, we like to say we're nuts about squirrels. 
<laughs> this is true. <laughs> and even pigeons. I mean, in New York, pigeons are called, you know, rats with wings. But I don't agree with that. Pigeons have amazing lives. They're completely social birds. They actually fill, feed their babies a milk produced in their crop. I mean, I spent a lot of time as a kid watching pigeons. And, and people would make fun of me. They called me pigeon girl. Um, but I didn't care because I feel like I had a moment every time that I watched a pigeon where I learned something new. And how many people have fought ants in their kitchen, right? I don't like ants in my kitchen, but I like them outside. Next time you're outside and you see an ant hill, spend some time watching it. See who's going in and out. I tell you, you can learn everything about the world by watching ants. They have wars. They carry their dead out. They bring food in. They take care of their young. They have, um, they have a whole kind of system, a micro animal with a super organism behind it, kind of like a bee. This is just scenes from my life of, of, of me and my son, my youngest son, spending time noticing the things around us, things that I've seen him fall in love with, from snails, which I'm a big fan of. He used to be a big fan of, but now he's 12. He's too cool to like snails. Fishing. We never eat the fish. We always catch and release. In fact, I can't even catch them. I feel too bad for them. But he does. He likes to catch them. The ladybugs in the corners of our house, even the spiders in the corner of our house, we've watched and paid attention to. And recently, did you know they found out that spiders have dreams and nightmares? Yeah, they did a whole study and they found out that spiders have nightmares. And I know if my friend Cy Montgomery was here, she would understand because I believe, like her, all animals have a consciousness. All animals have an emotional life. And something like a ladybug or a fish or even a spider should have dreams, could have dreams. Maybe they're dreaming about me and my vacuum. <laughs> time spent outside with our family dog and time tracking in our own backyard and being excited about finding something as mundane as deer tracks. Well, for me, a girl from Brooklyn, I still can't believe that I live in a place where deer live, even though they eat my shrubbery all the time. They are magnificent, and I love the fact that I can find their tracks. And I'd like to just remind you that something as humble and as simple as the toad is just as wild and valid as something like a tiger or a bald eagle where we ooh and ah. And I'm going to encourage you to go home and ooh and ah about the little things, the little animals in your world. In fact, visit with them. Spend time with them like you would with your neighbors. Go have a conversation with them and see what they're up to and see if they're interested in what you're up to. And I know we might feel too old like this, but step into the wings or the fur or the fins of an animal for a moment, even if it's just in your mind and imagining it. It really changes your perspective if you can think in the footprints of those creatures. And of course, remember that we are animals too. We don't always like to think of ourselves as wild animals, but we once were really wild animals and inside of us still lurks that wildness. And we are kin to all the animals on this planet. And our world is in trouble. I'm here as if you already didn't know. Kids, kids these days, people these days, we spend our days on a screen that takes us away from really experiencing the world, from really understanding it. I teach a lot of teens, and I'll be like, we're going to go out tracking. And they'll say, well, why would I do that? I can watch it on YouTube. Well, watching something and doing something are two really different things. Kids up until the age of 10 spend, this is going to shock you, over six hours a day on screens. That includes school time and after school time. Six hours. If you're a kid and you're only awake for 12 hours of the day, half of that time is on screens, right? So think of all the things they're not doing because they are tied up on screens. This is, this is are we entering the digital world? a virtual reality world instead of a world where we're looking through binoculars, we're looking through a virtual reality screen. 
This worries me as a human being, and I think it should worry all of us. And as adults, we have to model being outside and putting down our screens just as much as kids. We can't say kids these days because who made these kids these days? Who gave them all these things? We did. So it's imperative for us to remind ourselves to, to put down the screens and go outside with our children. Teens, teens spend 8.2 hours a day on screens. That's a 40 hour work week, right? So think of that. Their free time is spent on a, on a social media, playing video games. In a world where a screen can connect us to the farthest reaches of the world, we are in an epidemic of loneliness. This should be the work of childhood. This should be what kids are doing outside, mucking about, getting dirty, talking to a spider, watching anthills, problem solving, taking appropriate and inappropriate risks. That's how we learn. But if everything is on a screen, the risks that they're taking are big because they see things before they're ready to see them. But they're not actually engaging in any social connection. There's, this is what leads to this. We have the highest rate of teen anxiety, of teen suicide. And the science is in. It's, it's time on screens. So I'm here, like a little canary in a coal mine, to remind us that with the children in our own world, and as adults and educators and communicators and business leaders and people in, in active in a community, we need to find ways to kind of break this addiction and to return to, to time outside, to time connecting because all of this screen time makes us think we're connected, right? You can visit with a friend on Facebook that you didn't know, you know, you haven't talked to since you were six years old. But are you really connected to them? If you watch a video on fishing, do you really know how to fish? If you spend time in virtual reality, um, you know, going on a hunt, do you really know how to hunt? No. So. I'm going to just say as a final closing before I take questions and comments, um, I hope that all of you go home tonight, shut off your screen, mm -hmm. step outside, listen for the owls. It's owl mating season. Maybe you might even hear some spring peepers and wood frogs if they're still around after the snowstorm. And the next day and the next day and the next day with the people in your world, especially the young people, model for them how to be an actual citizen of this very real world and not some virtual world. And roll around on the floor with your dog or your cat. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
reading every naturalist writer, especially women that wrote about nature. That was my specialty. That was my thesis that I wrote. Um, and I got an internship with the Central Park Conservancy. And that's where I realized you could actually have a job that was a naturalist. I didn't know that. I worked with these amazing urban naturalists in Central Park in the North End, which was the Harlem area, Morningside Heights and Harlem, and um, bringing kids that lived actually next to the park but didn't go in the park because it was dangerous. And it was dangerous back then. It's not, it's really cleaned up now, but one time in the park, we're going along. I got a group of sixth graders, and all of a sudden, I hear, pew, 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 and the kids are like, Quack! drop down, they hit the ground. I'm like, what are you guys? What are you guys doing? They're like, it's gunshots. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I didn't know. I mean, I'd been mugged by knife, but never by gunshot. <laughs> so we hit the ground, and we and there when we had to stay in the park, there was actually a sniper on the building. Some of you might remember this, shooting into the park, and. Um, it was really scary. I got sidetracked. See what I mean? If I don't have my notes, I get sidetracked. <laughs> anyway, um, I did a whole writing on Central Park and the importance of green spaces in cities. And I read a lot about the writings that grew out of Central Park um, and the design that went into it. So I always knew I love science, but I'm not great at math. And I always knew that. I might want to be a wolf biologist, but getting through statistics was probably not in my cards. <laughs> so I found a way to combine the two. And thankfully, I had a fabulous advisor, Professor Patterson, who um, encouraged me to pursue my interest in women writing about nature and also kind of the local writing about Central Park, always place-based. I guess from the beginning, but thank you. That was a great question. Well, it's, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> that was a good story. <laughs> I know. Are there any questions so out there? You mentioned fear. Um, Forty years ago, screens were not an issue, but there were some children and sometimes some parents who were afraid of letting their children be out in Rome. And the radius of children have Rome has been shrinking. I remember a dramatic map that I saw some years ago that children may now normally on their own go no further than half a mile or a quarter mile from their house. So whether that's fear of nature or fear of someone coming down the street and putting them in a car, I wonder how that issue affects, mm -hmm. and also what you think is legitimate fear. We now live in an age of Lyme disease, yeah. which I never thought about 40 years ago. I know. Such a great question, David. Um, it, it is true. I've seen that statistics and the maps, too. But I mean, uh, when I grew up, even in Brooklyn, New York, I was a free-roaming kid. My parents would say, don't come in until the lights come on, the street lights come on. And even then, sometimes you could stay out when the street lights were on. There were even fireflies in Brooklyn when I was still, when I was there. Um, but because of the kind of sensationalism of um, crime, partly through our, our screen, you know, where we see like what's happening in Kansas. We never knew what was going on all over or around. It was just really local. But now we see there there is a lot of scary stuff and that fear has really reduced children's freedom. And that's the other thing I feel really strongly about is kids need free time. They need time to to get messy, to get in a little bit of trouble, to try things. Otherwise, how do they know what's an acceptable risk, right? If you're always there kind of negotiating how far they can jump or how fast they can swing or how far they can go from you, then as an adult, how do they even, how do they know what's risky? Like, here's an example. My son, my 12-year-old, when he was at the Hancock Elementary School, um, they weren't, they had to crawl on the ice because, good gosh, they might fall and get hurt. And I went and talked to the principal. I said, what am I going to do? It's, it's 15 years from now, I'm going to go to Shaw's, and there's going to be all the kids that are in David's class. It's icy out, crawling into the supermarket because they never learned how to walk on ice. 
So, I mean, I think as parents and as grandparents and as community members, we need to kind of embrace the freedom of kids being outside. Part of it is we don't, because we're so kind of like community isolated, we might be connected to our friend from when we were six year old, but we might not know our neighbor. We used to have neighborhood connections where, you know, my mom would say to Donna down the street, hey, did you see Susie? And Donna would call back and say, yeah, she's on her way to Patricia's house. But we don't live in a world like that anymore. So get to know your neighbors. That's what I'm going to say. Make neighborhood community. Make your kids feel comfortable in that. Um, and give them a lot of room on the leash. And in terms of things to be really worried about, yeah, Lyme disease is worrisome, but it shouldn't stop us from going outside. We just have to be really smart about how we do it. And that might include wearing clothing that has, you know, tick repellent on it, doing consistent tick checks of your child when they come in, or having them do it. Um, spending time educating yourself about what to look for, what to notice. But if we take our fear as kind of a, a green light to stay inside, that it, that's why we stay inside, we are losing so much of learning and so much growing and so much connecting. That is really scary. I could do a whole another hour on fear and how that drives us. That was a great question, David. Thank you. So much of what you said resonated with me. Um, I grew up in the Bronx for about 60 years, totally concreted, whatever. But it's so important what your grandparents and your parents model for you. My grandmother would go and feed the stray cats on a daily basis. In the, there was, she was modeling compassion. That's right. And um, even in, so we eventually moved to Massachusetts. Um, and there we encountered spiders and different things like my mother had never really been in that kind of an environment. But she looked at the spiders and said, well, they catch flies and they're good. I'm not afraid of spiders. And I see so many people that are like, oh my god, this is a spider and they're running away. <laughs> and if you see this as a child, the things that your parents feel happy with, you are also that way. And you can be taught so much compassion by modeling parents do. I love it. I love that. Um, and really, it, it can be your parents, but it, it, all it takes is one adult in a child's life who wants to be a co-explorer with them um, and who encourages them. And it can be a parent. It can be a teacher. For me, it was a person who really inspired me was Mead Kado. Before I met Mead Kado, I never knew what you could learn from scat. And now, in my neighborhood, they call me the princess of poop, which I take as a big compliment. <laughs> so, uh, you know, somebody who's passionate and showing compassion is, is so important. And I, ho I, I, don't, I hope you don't like the Yankees. <laughs> even us Brooklyn people don't like the Yankees. We like the Brooklyn Dodgers, even though they left a long time ago. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Ed, are you getting online? So, uh, so one, one of the things that uh, I know is the book we've been dedicated to the parents, the dual dedication, the dedication to your parents, and the dedication to the parents. I wanted to just talk a little bit about the parents, the inspiration that you got from them as educators, uh, if you don't mind, yeah. and how the Harris Center has enabled you to uh, implement those things and you know, realize your aspirations. Sure. Um, that's such a lovely question. Thank you so much. Um, well, my parents were school teachers in the New York City School Board of Education. I won't use the choice words that my parents often use to describe their time as teachers, because it's not polite. Um, and they did say to me, oh, and my brother, you can be whatever you want, but whatever you do, don't become a teacher. <laughs> so guess what my brother and I both are? Teachers. <laughs> they should have, they would have been better if they said, don't become a doctor or a lawyer. Then we probably would have been a doctor or a lawyer. But um, no, they, my parents were great. I mean, my. Parents, I mean, they 
They are, were first generation American. My family's from Ukraine. My grandparents, both sets came over and then had my parents here. And um, it's, it was sort of shocking that my parents chose to have a house in the country. That was like really beyond what anybody in their community and family had ever done. And that's where they put their extra money. I mean, we never did anything else except for go to Vermont, which when I was a kid, I'd complain, why can't we go to Disneyland? Why can't we go to Bermuda? You know, and they'd be like, well, we go to Vermont. And I'd be like, well, I'm going to Vermont. <laughs> you know, well, you know, that, they were on the right track because all of that time in Vermont, that's where my family was the most happiest. That was the seat of our joy as a family. And um, my dad just passed away, and as he was passing, as he was passing, um, my brother and I were with him, and, and we wanted to give him a good picture in his heart, in his mind. And where did we go? The front porch of Vermont. And that's where we were. Because for us, that was such a joy and such a gift. And that's really what part of that dedication was, is, is the joy that they gave to us and the freedom that it afforded us to be there. And freedom in, in spirit and mind. I mean, when you live in a city, all around you is, is sort of enclosed. It's like that landscape picture. You know, you, you go to Vermont. We, we lived up on Newfane Hill, this tiny little house. But you could see Mount Monadnock from our bedroom window and a big meadow, and that was a vista for us um, to look out. So, and my mom, um, her dad was a wild Ukrainian guy, and he would take my mom and her brother on these fishing trips. And I have these great photographs of them fishing in Connecticut, right, when Connecticut was wild, just wild to imagine. And my grandmother's in knickers, which was like dangerous. And, my, and they were drinking whiskey and smoking cigarettes. And there's my, my mom and her brother, you know, rolling in the grass. So that went into her heart. And so she went right along with it with my dad. So. And then the Harris Center, I can't say enough about how fortunate I was that my path crossed with the Harris Center in 19, I want to say 90. I think that's when I started, 1991, I was a camp counselor. And then I interned, and it just so happened that my intern supervisor, Claudia, um, met my, one of my roommates, John, and they fell in love. And they got married, and she left her job, and there I was, I got rid of one of my housemates, <laughs> I got a job, and the job has fit me so well. I've just been so fortunate because it's afforded me the freedom to be a creative educator. I could never have taught in a school. I, I think I would have just sucked me the soul out of my heart. But the Harris Center, I get an idea. I say, oh, Mead, I want to teach a class um, about slugs. And Mead would say, go ahead. Go ahead. Do it. And I did. And I just love that creative piece of my work at the Harris Center and I've just been the luckiest person and so lucky to have Mead as a mentor because he's just really inspired me. Now I might cry. I'm going to stop. Okay. Susie, this was a wonderful stories to share and you have shared your story beautifully with us tonight. Thank you for doing that. Thank you so much. So uh, our last Stories to Share program will take place on May 3rd, if we don't have a snowstorm that day. <laughs> Our speaker will be Dr. Don Caruso. Dr. Caruso is the president and CEO of the Cheshire Medical Center from 2015 to 2023. And he's going to speak on the subject of healthcare today and insider's perspective. It's going to be very timely and interesting for us. So, and before we close, I want to recognize the Civic Center Board President, David Beltate, who has some remarks and I just like to say, for Brian, our speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, a little good for your oh, Japanese craziness there. Oh, no, thank you. Um, I, 
a couple of notes I'd like to remind I'd like to remind everybody we have refreshments in the back and if you have a few questions you'd like to catch up with Susie on feel free um, we uh, at the end of this month we have a heart of the arts gala auction for any of you who are interested uh, that's April 27th and uh, on behalf of the board uh, I would like to Thank you all for coming. Thank Susie. Thank Jeff for being a stand-in. And have a great time. Good night.